Good evening, everyone, and welcome for welcome uh, to today's special webinar. My name is Freddie Matthews. I'm Director of Programme and Content here at The Conduit, and I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's special online event, No Easy Journey, Cobalt, Car Batteries and Human Rights, which was streaming for the first time ever uh, from The Conduit via Restream, YouTube, uh, LinkedIn and Facebook simultaneously. So welcome to you all wherever you're tuned in from. Um, welcome to all the Conduit members out there listening, who I think make up the largest audience tuned in today, but thank you also to anyone else tuning in from around the world. In case you're not aware, the Conduit is a collaborative community of people committed to creating a just, prosperous and sustainable future. Today's discussion is a perfect example of how we use our program to help generate solutions to the world's greatest challenges. Um, and as you'll already be aware of, uh, today's discussion will tell an incredibly important story, essentially the ethical impact of cobalt mining in relation to the accelerating demand for the mineral electric vehicle batteries rely on. Today's distinguished panel, panel includes Anika van Voudenberg, Executive Director of RAID, Rights and Accountability in Development, award-winning filmmaker and photojournalist Fiona Lloyd-Davies, senior analyst at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, Casper Rawls, as well as Emmanuel Umpala, Executive Director of African Resources Watch, a non-governmental organization that promotes equal access to natural resources, including land, water, and minerals in the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo. The discussion will be moderated by Executive Editor at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence and former Commodities Correspondent for the FT, Henry Sanderson. So without further ado, over to you, Henry. Thanks so much, Freddie, and welcome everyone to a, a fascinating topic and what looks set to be a great panel. Um, we all see that electric car sales are surging. Um, Tesla is the most valuable car company in the world. Um, yet to meet some of the, the climate goals that were talked about at Glasgow, we really need a rapid scale up of um, electric car production which is going to mean more batteries, which is going to be mean more raw materials. Cobalt, most electric cars have some coal batteries. So to scale up, a huge increase in uh, demand for cobalt. And today we're going to talk about some of the sort of ethical um, implications of that. Um, you know, unlike the oil market, um, DRC has an even bigger position in the cobalt market than Saudi Arabia has in the oil market. DRC supplies over seven um, of the world's cobalt. So when we talk about cobalt, we talk about DRC. Um, there's no EV revolution at the moment um, without the DRC. So with that, I'd like to, to kickstart the panel. I'd just like, like everyone first to just give a quick, quick who they are, where they're from. Um, well, let's start with you. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, uh, my name is Casper Rules. I'm the Chief Data Officer at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Um, my role really is to manage the data machine that lives within Benchmark. So that means my team are every day speaking to mining companies, chemical processors, cell manufacturers, cathode manufacturers, automakers about the battery supply chain. That can be information on pricing uh, or raw materials, supply, demand, etc. So, uh, yeah, my analyst team here essentially collecting the data directly from the market and then feeding that back into the rest of benchmark the different products we have price assessments and market assessments and raw material forecasts and data got it thanks emmanuel um we're really grateful you can join us from from coazi you know the center of um the cobalt mining in the drc do you want to give a quick introduction Yeah, perhaps, yes. Emmanuel. Um, my name is uh, Emmanuel Umpula, um, Executive Director of Crewwatch. Yeah, perhaps, Emmanuel. Yeah. Can, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Can you? Can yes, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, now I'm uh, in Kolwezi. Uh, the world is uh, world. Uh, uh, cobalt capital. Thank you. I'm happy to be uh, with you here. Thanks very much. Um, Annika, do you want to give a brief introduction? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Annika van Woodenberg. I'm also a proud Conduit member. I'm the executive director of RAID, Rights and Accountability in Development, 
we're a small group of lawyers and legal experts who do work on corporate accountability. And we've done a lot of work on looking at human rights violations by large multinational companies in Africa, not least in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and have looked a lot at what is happening with cobalt um, in Congo and hence in the supply chain of EVs. So you'll hear probably a little bit more from me later um, about some of the recent research we've published. Thanks. Great, thanks so much. And last but not least, uh, Fiona, do you want to um, give a brief intro and leave you're gonna show um, a clip from, from one of your films. So that'd be great to see. That's right. Hi, uh, my name's Fiona Lloyd Davis. I'm uh, a filmmaker and um, work out of Studio Nine Films. And I've been working in Democratic Republic of Congo on and off since, uh, well, for 20 years, but really for the last 18 months, um, looking uh, in a detailed, more detailed way at cobalt and the human rights and environmental issues um, surrounding the mining and extraction. And uh, with Robert Flummerfelt, we made a film for Al Jazeera English called The Cost of Cobalt, and we're going to show um, a short clip of that now. In the heart of Katanga Province, Democratic Republic of Congo, these miners are digging for a mineral essential for clean energy. The mineral we need to make the batteries for electric cars. Cobalt is playing a key role in the battle to reduce carbon emissions and slow climate change. Most of the world's reserves are in DRC, and artisanal miners like Mwenze extract about yeah. one third of the country's output in this way. <coughs> Working underground is dangerous, yet global demand for cobalt is insatiable. For many here, it's their sole source of income. But most of the DRC's cobalt is mined on an industrial scale, from vast open pits like this, owned either by the state or by large multinational corporations. And there's a problem, because many of these mines are adjacent to towns and villages. Now research is showing that the methods used in such places to produce this mineral could be poisoning the environment, with dire health consequences for the population. At University Hospital in Katanga's capital, Lubumbashi, Mirai and her husband, Gilor, have brought their two children to see a doctor. Sebastian Mbui Muzanzai is a pediatric maxillofacial surgeon who's become a specialist in repairing birth defects. It has been 15 years that I'm taking care of uh, many congenital malformations. Many families now are coming to see us. At the beginning, it was very hard for them because they didn't know where they can go with their child or their children if they have got congenital malformations. They put to 
sa mtoto anazali kwa hivi mwanamke kuna kata seni bubu ashishikie na hivi huyu yeye anashikia mambo yetu kile kiko nguvu ni paka kusema Ben, three years old, and Jessica, 14 months, were both born with cleft palates. This is a birth defect found throughout the world and can be linked to mothers' exposure to environmental factors early on in pregnancy. We were asking some questions to parents, to people where they are living, to see if we could find a link between one environmental factor which can be linked to those malformations that we are seeing in patients. We found that there were links between mining activities and the occurrence of orofacial cleft, for example. And uh, for that, we found that fathers or mothers who are working in uh, mining companies are sometimes three or four times at risk to have children with orofacial clefts. Sakumbi, you could buy a quick color video carib, eh? Do you want to miss Conagra and say good quam? All of them, they've got a similar malformation. I think we can make our surgery without problem. Great. Thanks so much, Fiona. That's, that's an interesting um, video. Um, I just wondered, um, in terms of the health impacts, is this something that um, you know, just being studied, just being looked at, or or, or is it something that we know um, that we know a lot of already about these links between mining and, and health impacts? Well, what the film goes on to show is um, uh, that there's a range of um, uh, birth defects, and obviously it's a very complex um, area and difficult to pin down any one particular cause. But WHO have identified that. Um, uh, DRC has the highest regional rate of birth defects and one of the highest in the world um, at 71 per 1,000 children. Um, and uh, the, the film looked at some research that had been published in 2020, which they had been starting to collect um, as early as uh, 2009 and uh, a specific um, study that was done between 2013 and 2015. So this has been, you know, they've been aware of this for some time. Um, it also, what the film also showed is that another study that they, they're still yet to publish, but they mapped um, an area in Lubumbashi and found that the area um, where uh, there were um, maternal um, centers where, where, where women went to give birth, um, that it was a much higher incidence of birth defects in the areas with mines and smelters than there were with the um, uh, maternal units in the areas that didn't have mines and smelters. So they're building a, a sort of body of evidence and there's also other evidence about the contamination environmentally um, of water, fish um, and plants. And then there's also the whole issue of air pollution. And we know in this country that, um, you know, with, with, with emissions and, and, and trying to reduce emissions, that there's, you know, there's a lot of evidence um, that, that shows uh, air pollution with um, asthma and, uh, and even child death. Um, and so the, the issue are is that um, there's very little resources. It's very difficult for them to... Um, uh, you know, gather the evidence and publish it in any um, sort of really broad, systematic way because, you know, it's much more convenient um, for everyone just to ignore that this is going on and for the large mining companies who are very, very aggressive uh, about even letting us film. Um, you know, one of um, uh, the film that uh, uh, director Robert Flummerfelt was, was there with a um, local, local crew and one of our crew was arrested just by standing near the open cast mine um, and was detained for um, 36 hours in the military prison. And that was just for pointing a camera in a public area towards the mine. So, you know, the big industrial mines are very aggressive. And I think that's why in the past, a lot of 
um, attention has been focused on artisanal mining where you know there are lots of issues and health issues as well um, but it's a much it's a tiny fraction of, of the whole picture where the majority is actually done through um, industrial mining and with these very dire consequences of um, uh, the process the acids and the treatments that are used to to treat the minerals is leaking and leaching into the environment causing long-term health effects which the evidence seems to be building. Emmanuel I just wanted to ask you do you also see evidence building um, that shows that there's, um, these mines are contaminating the environment and local people? Can you hear okay, Emmanuel? It's okay. I think the line is, is good. And okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Thank you for the film. And uh, uh, it's uh, good to know what is going on where um, they are mining copper and cobalt. And thank you for that. Yeah, of course, there is a lot of uh, uh, problem in, in Congo. Uh, especially in Kolwezi, because now I'm in Kolwezi. As I said, uh, the world uh, uh, is cobalt capital. And uh, yeah, of course, there is a lot of problem. Uh, with contamination, water contamination. And um, we've been um, working on uh, several reports. Uh, one, um, Glencore, and uh, the second one on um, CDM, which is uh, um, uh, Wayu cobalt uh, uh, companies, and we with samples and we took them to the lab, and of course there was higher level of uh, copper and cobalt, and also a higher level of um, uh, uh, leads. Um, yeah. So and uh, you know um, this has uh, uh, um, an effect on the health of people living around. And um, yeah, also on plants because on um, what they are growing, food and everything. So of course there is a lot of cases of, uh, and and that's why we are um, not as NGOs, not just uh, writing a report to to make uh, these these um, cases be known, but to ask to ask the state to act uh, to prevent uh, that kind of contamination and to especially to protect victims because um, they need help um, and also they need to be uh, supported by NGOs like us uh, for them uh, to be heard, their voice to be heard. Yeah, so it's uh, common and um, Anik has an experience because he, she works in Congo and she's uh, well uh, connected to what is happening uh, to Congo. Yeah. We'll come back, um, Emmanuel. Okay. But Annika, I just want to bring you in here because, as Fiona mentioned, right, um, most people imagine um, Congo and cobalt to involve child mining, um, you know, hand labor, digging by hand, but that only accounts for about a third of supply. Most of it is these big industrial mining companies, um, a mixture of Chinese um, and Western. Um, I mean, you recently released a report sort of condemning the conditions there. Um, describing discrimination and extremely low pay um, at some of these mines. Could you just um, describe, um, you know, why why that's the case? What's going on there? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Henry. And in, indeed, so my organization, RAID, with a, a group of Congolese labor lawyers, just released um, a very long, detailed report, 87 pages, looking into conditions at five of the key cobalt mines. Now, of course, there are many others, so I wouldn't say we have the full picture, but I'd say we have a good representative sample. And we looked at three in particular of the largest cobalt mines in Congo. And what we found was really disturbing and um, yeah, widespread worker exploitation. Um, let me just share my screen just with a, a couple of kind of um, slides that may be um, of interest. Um, so let me just check. Henry, are you seeing that? Just want to check, Henry, if you can see um, what I'm showing. I don't I see the screen yet, no. Um, oh, okay. Well done, let me come back. 
Do so you want to try again? Yeah, exactly. Just one second. The technology. Here we go. Let's see if this is going to work. Uh, we had it working earlier, didn't we? But it never kind of just when okay. you want well, to, does it? Well, let me, let me Should talk we come about back to it. that? But I know it's, it's working now. Perfect. It's working now. Okay. Oh, great. Let me. Um, so just, just uh, I don't want to kind of slow you, show you a ton of slides. Um, just a few things. We all know cobalt's essential for the green energy transition. Since we're talking about electric vehicles, I just want to show this slide because it shows that the cobalt market, if you look in the top right here, electric vehicles account for about 50% of that market. So when we talk about cobalt, electric vehicles are the big chunk of it. And just because it's always useful to know what we've got in our pockets and what we're using. So a smartphone is roughly eight grams, but an electric vehicle is roughly on average 10 kgs of cobalt. Um, tablets, scooters, laptop computers have the same. Um, as Henry said, 70% of the world's cobalt mined in Congo. Here's a picture of one of the mines. Um, I'm only going to focus for the moment on industrial mines. Um, artisanal labor, artisanal mining, which makes up 20% or less of Congo's exports, has been more in the news due to child labor. But the focus on the industrial mines has been less. Um, the industrial mining companies that we looked at, almost all of them, will claim or say that their cobalt is clean and free from human rights abuses. Um, that's not what our research found. So here, just in a nutshell, some of our findings. We found extensive worker exploitation. Many were on these precarious contracts, and these are individuals not hired directly by the mines, but hired indirectly by subcontractors. And it's particularly that sector of the workforce, which is more than half of the workforce. In fact, uh, well over half, 57% are hired indirectly. And for them, there is extremely low pay, um, less than the living wage. I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. But the, the low pay is sometimes uh, as low as 30 pence a day. They work excessive hours with little time off, widespread racism, discrimination, and physical violence, almost no benefit, and very dangerous working conditions. This is the kind of words that people and, and descriptions that they used about what workers were facing on a regular basis. They were kicked and slapped, they were beaten with sticks, they were insulted, humiliated, shouted at and pulled around by their ears. Um, this was especially so in some of the Chinese run mines, though we also heard of conditions by Chinese subcontractors at some of the European mines, um, for example, by Eurasian Resources Group. Um, many workers low <laughs> salaries. Um, earning well below the living wage, which we calculated at $402 a month. So by no means excessive, which is the minimum, the absolute minimum for a decent life. As I said, some earned 30 pence a day. Look, here's just one testimony from one of the workers that we spoke to, which gives just a sense of how dire for thousands of workers the situation is at some of these large scale industrial mines, with many of them easily being fired at the drop of a hat because of the precarious contracts on which they uh, are employed. I want to just briefly touch on this. And um, for those of you who, who may not know, Congo in the past was a big provider of rubber and particularly so at the turn of the century, early 1900s, when the motor car first appeared and the rubber was needed for the tires. And there are many in Congo who feel that what we're seeing today with cobalt and EVs 
appears to them to be almost a repeat of history. And that might be something interesting for us to discuss is how can we avoid that repeat of widespread exploitation and incredibly poor work conditions linked to this boom in electric vehicles. And of course, look, you know, I don't think that this is inevitable. Um, I actually think ethical batteries are possible. And what we would very much urge for is a just transition, um, as, as this says here. Um, and, you know, really looking to ensure that we have um, that we have cobalt, which is contributing to a, a proper green energy transition. Um, let me just quickly say, Henry, just the five mines we looked at in case that's of interest to anyone. So we looked at Glencore's Katanga Copper Company, the largest cobalt mine in the world. We looked at Eurasian Resources Group's Metal Coal Mine, another major mine, and then three Chinese operated mines, uh, Tenke Fungarume, run by China Moli Denim, and so Sikomin and Somides, both run by Chinese consortiums. The first three are the most productive cobalt mines in the world, so Glencore's, ERG's, and Tenke Fungarume's. Um, and it would be, we would be hard pressed to find electric vehicles on our roads today that don't include the cobalt from some of these mines that I've just mentioned. And it puts a real emphasis on us looking at supply chains and, you know, what are Tesla, BMW, Volvo, VW, all those big EV car manufacturers doing about ensuring that they're responsibly sourcing. Um, and especially when we've just been through COP26, lots of emphasis on electric vehicles and the need for, you know, moving away from the internal combustion engine. I am completely in favor of that. And I think many of us on the call on, on this discussion probably are, but we need that to be a just transition. And that means tackling the issues around the environmental damage as Fiona's laid out. And it means tackling the issues um, around the supply chain. I think it's totally doable and happy to discuss that a bit more as, as to what's needed. But part of doing that is identifying what the problem is. And I think our research has really identified we have a worker exploitation, labor rights abuses problem at the beginning of where electric vehicles start at the cobalt mines in Congo and tackling that in a way that benefits these Congolese workers of which are tens of thousands of cobalt mines is essential. Got it. Thanks so much, Annika. And um, just to know that you did get responses from four companies, right? And their responses are on um, on your on your website as well. Um, so, so, so Casper, just to to move on to you, um, could you give us a sense of um, demand for cobalt? Because you know, not every electric car, especially in China, uses cobalt in the batteries, and we have seen um, these cheaper. Uh, batteries called lithium iron phosphate batteries come out in China, which don't use cobalt. Um, there is that option available for car makers. What, what, how do you see demand for cobalt um, over the next decade or so? Yeah, um, yeah, as you say, yeah, thanks, Henry. Um, there are lots of different types of lithium ion battery. They all have a, you know, some similar traits, but they have different ingredients, different, different recipes. Um, and as you say, some, some use cobalt, some don't. Um, the two the two main kind of battery types or cathode types that go into lithium uh, to EVs uh, um, nickel containing uh, NCM and, and that contains cobalt and NCA and then you have this this type that's called LFP lithium ion phosphate that doesn't contain any cobalt so not all EVs will will have cobalt in them um, but the ones that do uh, have varying amounts as well so you have again slightly different recipes that give different let's say battery performance characteristics. Um, and so it's, you know, it's quite complex. I don't want to get into the technicalities of all the different battery types, but, um, you know, even with these different low cobalt chemistries that are sort of coming into the market now, which are use less cobalt, but allow the vehicle to drive a bit further, we're still going to see some very significant growth. So um, at the moment, you know, 2021, the cobalt market is around 145,000 tons a year of which getting on for 100,000 tonnes will be going into batteries as a, as a whole. 
Um, but by the time we get to 2030, the cobalt market's going to grow to around 350,000 tonnes, with the vast majority going into batteries. The rest goes into um, kind of industrial applications that goes into things like jet engines, medical in instruments, catalysts, things like that. So um, very, very significant growth expected by the industry. Um, and, you know, there is a changing picture in terms of the cathode types. But as you said in your introduction, I noticed kind of there will be no electric vehicle revolution without uh, cobalt. And that, you know, that cobalt is likely to come from the DRC. Got it. Thanks so much. Um, and Emmanuel, I just want to return to you because Annika's report um, is fascinating in that it, it talks about the Chinese mines um, and the conditions of the Chinese mines. And obviously, you know, Chinese companies produce the bulk of the, uh, um, the cobalt um, in the DRC. Do you notice a difference between the Chinese companies and, and the Western ones? And, and is there improvement from from the Chinese companies? <laughs> I thank you very much. This is a good question. And uh, I think it's uh, also hard to respond to that kind of question. But it's OK for me to, to try. And uh, I think I, I will start just to give you an idea of how it, um, a, a Chinese companies came to Congo. And uh, I think the uh, small story is that when we, the Congolese government, uh, in 2002, uh, liberalized uh, the mining sector in Congo because it was just um, it was uh, controlled by uh, state company companies. Um, they, we 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 got a lot of uh, Western companies coming in, and from 2000 and 2010, there was no Chinese companies in Congo. They, if maybe there was there, but there was less. Um, we used to have uh, for, um, Western companies. And uh, so from 2000 and now, um, Western companies has sold their uh, to Chinese. And uh, so sometimes there's the debate, the debate uh, saying that uh, Congolese government um, uh, made a deal with uh, Chinese uh, companies. Uh, this is not true because if you try many big companies, they they got their shares uh, from Western companies. So why? It's because from 2002, we uh, NGOs published a lot of reports uh, talking about human rights violation, contamination, and everything. So there was a debate between Western and Chinese companies. Western was saying that we are work, we are working in the same market with Chinese companies, which are not um, they don't have any regulation, so it uh, it's not an equitable market and a competition between Western and Chinese companies. So that's why they, they sold and uh, their shares, and then now we have Chinese companies. So the question is uh, is the situation um, uh, uh, improved from 2000 and now? Uh, my, my, my answer is no. So we are going, we are going from worse to worse. And um, so we don't um, uh, have the, improve, the improvement of the situation. And so I think that this is the case and the situation. And I think um, I can give the, the case of uh, uh, Tenke Fungurum Mining Companies, which is uh, owned by uh, China Molibondum. It used to be... Um, uh, to uh, to be a um, a, um, a Freeport uh, Mark Morand uh, um, company, which is an American uh, company, and in 2015 they sold to Chinese um, to China Molibendo. And if you go there, you can see the standard from where uh, uh, um, Freeport Mark Morand uh, were. Uh, up to now, you will find that there is a, a huge difference in terms of uh, standards. And we, we, we don't understand why the, the, the China, China, um, Ma, um, Freeport Mark Moran sold uh, its share um, and left Congo. We don't, we, we don't know the reason. And, uh, but uh, I can uh, um, admit that there is a big difference. And I think also maybe 
one uh, one explanation it, it can be that we, we can leave Chinese to pollute water and to do whatever they like, but at the same time we know that we, in the market we can get these uh, these minerals without having any responsibility, you know, because if you you, you and now the Chinese are producing in Congo and they are violating human rights and they are not respecting anything. But at the same time, big companies getting minerals from Congo uh, without coming to Congo. So it's, uh, I can understand that in that way. And yeah, um, yeah, the situation is getting uh, worse and worse. It's not uh, in terms of a standard. Yeah, thank you. Got it. So thank, thanks so much, Emmanuel. And um, Anako, I just wanted to ask about the Chinese companies because you talk about a sort of new form of co uh, colonization um, almost with companies. Um, I mean, what's your what's your sense that um, the Chinese, you know, they want to sell into the electric car supply chain as well? I mean, how what's your sense about how sensitive they are to improving their image to actually making improvements? Yeah, I, sh I should say we we at RAID didn't use the word um, colonization or neo-colonialism. It is, however, the word used by some of the workers. So it is how they describe it. Um, look, the, the, chi the Chinese play a huge role in this market. And, and you know, and they're increasingly in, um, in huge amounts of the extractive industry across Africa. And frankly, they're also doing more infrastructure development than frankly any other country in Africa, right? So there, there are pros and cons. And look, I, I want to be the first to say that I don't think European countries have a great history in Africa either. So I, I don't think the answer here is demonizing the Chinese. Yet I would say in our research, some of the worst workers' rights conditions we found were either by Chinese subcontractors or at the Chinese mines. What I do think is useful is we've had some engagement with some of the Chinese mines, and I think there's a real need for those companies to carry out pretty urgent investigations into the racism, discrimination, and workers' rights violations at those mines. It's not just Chinese mines as well. So I think, you know, let's take the picture as a whole. Um, and there are concerns at a number of these other mines as well. Across the board, whether it was European controlled mines or whether it was Chinese mines, the huge percentage of outsourced labor, so going to subcontracting companies or labor agencies, that's what's at the heart of the worker exploitation and labor rights abuses. And it was absolutely clear what workers told us, as well as the managers of these subcontracting companies, and they told us very clearly the reason multinational mining companies are doing this is threefold. One is to lower costs. Cheap labor helps to lower costs. Number two, to have arm's length legal responsibility. So companies can say it's not us, it's our subcontractor who paid such low wages or who didn't ensure there was time off or who didn't ensure they had appropriate health care, et cetera. And the third reason was to stand in the way of unionization. So I think for that to change, we need those further up the supply chain to really put the pressure on. Well, I think the, certainly Chinese and European companies can change without that pressure, but I think the pressure would help and is likely to be more effective than just civil society reports. And, and I think this is where the likes of Tesla and others come in. And, and, you know, these are big consumer facing companies who promote their products as green and good for the environment and without, you know, contributing to um, uh, human rights violations. Right. And we need them to walk the talk and to actually do that. Got it. Yeah, Casper, just on that point, I mean, it's interesting because a few years ago, you know, Amnesty put out a report about um, child labor in, in the Congo. And we did see a lot of car companies sort of want to distance themselves from the Congo. And I think BMW said, no, we won't source any cobalt from the DRC. But now we have seen companies like Tesla willing to announce all their cobalt suppliers, right? And willing to buy from, from the Congo. I mean, Casper, can you just tell me what, what's changed? You know, what are car makers thinking? 
Yeah, um, yeah, there has been a change since since 2016, that's for certain. I think there's a, a variety of different strategies that car makers are taking out there. Um, but I think generally kind of the accepted standard in the industry now is a realization that actually, you know, the, the, the energy transition does present a big opportunity to, to the DRC as a nation um, because of the increased requirement for not only cobalt, but copper as well. So copper is the other big winner um, from the energy transition, you know, along with other minerals like lithium and nickel. Um, and so, you know, by shying away from the DRC, which was the initial reaction back in, the, in, in 2016, that was actually harmful. I mean, that was more about artisanal worker, artisanal miners, and we're talking about industrial here. But what it meant was that companies were scared of sourcing material and essentially it became even harder for those um, industrial miners to make a living because the cobalt price dropped, um, the sourcing became, I don't want to say, uh, it, it, you know, it's harder for, for those miners to sell that product so they were getting lower prices, dealing with less scrupulous companies um, to sell it to. So it did create a lot of problems. But now the industry has realised actually we can work with the DRC, um, you know, Part of that is that you know many of these companies have done their own internal audits. There's a, a number of different groups out there that can do audits for you. And so they've grown more comfortable with the sourcing and therefore have kind of qualified some of their suppliers as um, safe suppliers. But I think there's that realization, as, as I say, that you know, big, big, globe, probably one of the most globally recognized brands, someone like Tesla, has now in their sustainability report said that they want to work with the DRC and you know sustainably source cobalt and that their cobalt requirement is going to increase in the future so that's certainly the way the industry is going I'd say some are more advanced than others there's still some companies that are sort of as I say shying away from the DRC and trying to look elsewhere but fundamentally if you're a, a large automaker who's going to be uh, let's say one of the tier one automakers that's uh, producing huge amounts of EVs um, you're going to probably have to deal with with buying DRC cobalt. I think, you know, using that buying power is probably one of the most powerful things they can do to ensure sustainable sourcing. Just Emmanuel, I mean, do you think it's possible to source sustainably then um, from from the DRC, like these car companies like these say? Car companies say. <laughs> yeah, I can. Yeah, I, I think um, it's uh, it's possible. And uh, as uh, Anek mentioned, so you have 80% uh, uh, of uh, cobalt coming from uh, uh, industrial companies, and uh, uh, between 15 and 20% uh, coming from artisanal mining. And, and uh, the question of Tesla, Tesla is with Glencore, which has uh, an, an industrial mine. And of course, it's uh, a good, for, for me, I think it's, uh, it's possible. And uh, but we should work uh, to improve um, 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 to improve uh, working condition uh, in some uh, mining companies, but uh, also and um, uh, more in um, artisanal mining. Because if you try to see the way people are uh, working in artisanal mining, it's uh, a modern uh, slavery. And uh, that's why we are calling for people to engage, really to engage. And a company like Tesla can play a good role. And if you remember when we published the report with Amnesty in 2016, I think we pointed also big companies like Tesla, like Apple, uh, to be uh, um, part of the solution. So uh, for us, it's a good way for them uh, to make pressure to the um, um, the um, um, uh, cast, uh, where, where, where they are buy, buy, buying their minerals, and like uh, Glencore, like uh, Trafigura has uh, um, um, uh, yeah. activities in Congo, so they, they can uh, put pressure. And I admit that it's, it's possible, and and uh, but it's a good way also for us because when we published the report in 2016. The, the, I think everyone was saying, I'm not sourcing from Congo. I'm not um, uh, sourcing from... So it, it's good to know who is sourcing uh, minerals from Congo. It's good to know. And it's a good way for uh, a group like, like us, NGOs, a Red of Watch, to, to ask them to be more... Um, uh, to, 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 to be uh, 
uh, to demand the improvement of condition on the ground. So I think it's a good way because if they don't clearly say where they are sourcing, that means uh, uh, human rights violation will uh, continuing, uh, continuing. And uh, yeah, so we, I think it's good to, to source, but to know who is sourcing where and how we can ask them to improve the condition on the ground. Got it. Thank you. Um, Fiona, I just want to bring you in here. We haven't talked much about artisanal mining, which Emmanuel just mentioned. Um, I mean, do you think it's possible to, to improve um, the condition of artisanal miners, to, to regulate it, to allow them to, to enter the electric car um, supply chain? I mean, the government of the Congo wants to create um, you know, one company to, to formalize this, this sector. I mean, is it possible to sustainably buy artisanal mining um, from, from the Congo? Well, it's obviously quite a complex and, and interesting issue. Um, I did a film um, about more than 10 years ago, actually, about a scheme that was trying to um, do this in Eastern Congo, in the mines that um, uh, of uh, tin tantalum and tungsten. And um, they introduced a, a scheme called the ITSI scheme, which was to um, sort of create a, a system of bagging and tagging and to create accountability. Um, and there's just about to be um, a, a report and assessment actually on, on how successful it's been. And uh, unfortunately it's proved to be um, extremely unsuccessful and has actually sort of promoted um, in a way more um, uh, sort of uh, more smuggling and um, created more difficulties. So it's obviously, you know, a really challenging issue about how to um, uh, do this in a responsible way that, um, you know, puts the workers first. And I think, you know, the, the issue here is that people are um, desperate to earn a living and that here is a, a resource that is available in some ways to many people. And it also means that they give up farming and they give up some um, other, other really important um, jobs and skills that are needed for their own survival because they see a way of making a lot of money quickly or, or for them in their, their ways to get a resource that could um, make uh, make money for them and so there's also issues about um, growing crops that are um, falling behind and, and issues with that as well so it is a, a complex thing and obviously um, it's really you know it comes down to will large companies pay um, you know, sufficient money to the, the actually costs, and you know the um, you know the the trend is that obviously they want to keep their costs as low as possible and exploit as many people as possible. You know, to 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 make then they can have bigger profits. And I know anecdotally, when Robert was filming, um, he did hear from people that um, you know it's important to remember that mining um, has been going on in Katanga for you know a hundred years. Um, with other minerals, um, uranium in, in the 40s and 50s, and the uranium for the um, atomic bombs came from um, Katanga, um, as well as, you know, in other areas of Congo, uh, rubber before that. Um, but in Katanga, there has been mining for some time, and it seems to be, you know, only in, in the last sort of 30 years, and Annika and Emmanuel may be able to have, you know, more specific um, examples of this, but it's really, it seemed to be anecdotally only in the last sort of 20, 30 years, that there has been so so many issues um, uh, and compromises and corners cut in the way that mines are being um, built and that industrial mining is being being produced. So, you know, it's so, sorry to go back to industrial mining, but because that's the sort of biggest area, you know, it it comes down to whether um, I think people want to hold big mining companies to account and actually. You know, keep shining a light on it, and I think one of the biggest sort of challenges with Congo is um, that there is this, you know, um, thanks to to Joseph Conrad, there is this sort of terrible, you know, dark cloud that hangs over Congo, which is um, sort of uh, uh, in changes the way people perceive and want to um, deal and do business with it. And for me, one of the most, I think, interesting and, and, and exciting parts of, of making the film was to actually work 
with Congolese scientists and doctors who are trying to be part of the solution and that their work and the work of you know people like Emmanuel that the the resources and the expertise are there and there to be um, supported um, and in a way that's maybe more what what needs to be done to to actually um, bring Congolese people into this much much more than is at the moment. Emmanuel, I just want to ask you about the government's effort to to formalize artisanal mining. Artisanal mining. They've created this They've company, created EGC, this company EGC, EGC, to to buy up all the artisanal all the mining, artisanal mining, um, mining um, and to make sure they get, sure they get a fair price. I mean, what I mean, do you what, think, what, think this can be this successful? Can be successful? Uh, yeah, I, th I think uh, I'm here because we are talking about EGC. Uh, that's the place where I am. We are talking about EGC. And um, there is a debate, and we just published a report, this one, um, talking about the formalization of uh, uh, atomic mining. And I think uh, it's a good idea, and I can support uh, the fact that the, the Congolese government is trying to, to formalize the, the, the system of atomic mining. And that's why they created um, the Entreprise General du Cobalt. But I think there is a, um, a big issue is like, for, for us, we need an open market. So if um, EGC will buy all cobalt and will allow everyone to come and buy a cobalt from EGC, that will be a good idea. And that will help to improve working condition because one of the problems, because when you, you hear about atomic mining, people are not talking um, about poverty. Why they, what the reason why people are going to mine or why people are, um, uh, they accept to go and work in the poor condition because they are poor and they need to make a living. So, and uh, if you try to see um, uh, the effort people are making, even at the international level, no one is trying to, to sort out the problem of poverty. So if EGC can be a solution to formalize the, 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 the system, that's okay. But the thing is, where we are, the debate is, EGC has signed the contract with Trafigura. So Trafigura is giving to EGC um, 80 million, and then they have all the control of cobalt. So I think that it's a huge question here and we are, as NGOs, we think that the market should be open. And uh, if um, EGC need to be successful, then we should have a, an open market for um, uh, each company which like to come and buy cobalt from them. Uh, it can buy, but here it's not. It's it's uh, they, they they are saying that they, uh, everyone can come and buy, but if you read the contract, they've signed with. Trafigura, you will see that Trafigura has the monopoly to buy all cobalt. So for us, that is uh, is, uh, is too bad in terms of formalization because uh, when we talk about um, uh, why we uh, we was talking that we're saying that the condition was bad because Chinese had the monopoly of buying minerals. If you go to to a mine, we find that a Chinese company has the monopoly to buy all minerals. So we need to change, to formalize the system and also to have an open market. So we are losing at that um, part because uh, EGC is trying to sign a monopoly contract with Trafigura. And that is not fair for us. And we think maybe if they, they keep working on that without um, hearing from us, that will be a big, a big uh, loss of time and uh, what we are doing to, to, to help the Congolese um, government. Got it. And, got it. And, and Casper, just quickly Kasper, before just we quick. move on to um, how much the market need um, artisanal supply? We talked about it being one third of supply, but obviously moves with prices, right? When prices are high, more people come out to mine. Um, but you know, how much does the electric car demand? Are we going to need this uh, um, artisanal supply? <laughs> Yeah, uh, depending on what year you're talking about, we're going to need a lot, you know, a lot of cobalt, and actually the market's going to go into deficit. So in terms of artisanal supply, it's not 
At the moment, you know, particularly with the impact of COVID and, and activity, the number's a lot less than 30% of DRC. It's, it's more like 10, uh, maybe a bit less than 10% at the moment, but that's also partly because you've seen a big increase in industrial production as well. So um, in recent years, that number's gone down a bit. But yeah, I mean, fundamentally um, at the moment with supply additions, not just in the DRC, but globally, the market's going to fall into deficit around 2024, 2025. So not that far away when you consider kind of building a new mine from, let's say, discovery to production, um, a, a very kind of achie achievable, but very aggressive and quick timeline would be to do that in about seven years. So you've got this, this big time lag difference between when you find a project and you can get it online and, and you know how quickly the market's going to need more, more material so i think artisanal can make up a really important additional swing supply to the market as you say it's particularly more active when prices are higher and we're now moving into quite a high price market with metal prices approaching 30 dollars a pound um so that supply will be needed but i think you know going back to egc you know the key question is um understanding how that's going to operate um and you know the success of that operation fundamentally um the acceptance of that material by the wider supply chain by the kind of ev manufacturers and consumer electronics manufacturers so there's still a lot of work to be done but certainly the artist you know artisanal production can can be an important part of the su supply gap and, and add to that but um you know it's still very early days with egc and i think you know people are going to want to see a lot more about how that company is going to operate and the transparency they'll get about the sourcing of the material and knowing where it's come from the operations and, and you know fun, you know being able to audit those and see those as well hey annika i just want to ask you i mean are we close to a car company coming out and saying i'm happy to buy um artisanal uh cobalt cobalt mine by hand from the drc and i accept that there will be some risks right there's never going to be or it's hard to achieve zero risk um formalization right um, I mean, we've talked about the audits that these car companies do. Um, I mean, could, could we see them accept some artisanal supply in their EV, actually admit to that? Well, I think certainly most of the car companies we've spoken to in recent months are much more keen to buy their cobalt from the industrial mines. And that is also, of course, the, the bulk of the market. Um, but I think even on that, you know, this is where we have a, a weakness in the auditing and in the supply chain due diligence, this word that is often used about really checking whether or not environmental harm, human rights violations, worker exploitation is in your supply chain. And really our research showed that this is in fact one of the major gaps. And in some ways it's a success story because the success of the reporting on child labor in the artisanal mines has forced companies to look more carefully what is happening Where's our cobalt coming from? The problem then is the questions they're asking are very limited. Is there child labor? Um, is there forced labor or slave labor? And they don't really ask any further questions. And so quite a lot of the standards we've seen, which by the way, are all voluntary. So companies don't have to do this at all. International law and domestic law on this is very weak. So all their kind of voluntary steps are to check around a number of critical questions. And frankly, they're just not asking the right questions. And our discussions with the car companies has been, you need to ask the questions about worker exploitation, environmental harm, even if you're not sourcing from artisanal mining. And I think that's really where there's a major gap. All the standards and auditing today are A, voluntary, and B, not asking the right questions. Um, I would say, and Casper's right, that I, I think the electric vehicle companies are beginning to look at this more. Tesla having come out and, and publicly shown, here is our supply chain, this is where we get the cobalt from, sets at least the standard of other companies needing to do the same and to be public. I think we now need to move on to have car companies press their supply chain to say, we must be paying the living wage. We should pay the living wage in this incredibly impoverished country in Africa, coming out of years and years of conflict, and to really ensure that they're not contributing to environmental harm in Kolwezi while claiming to clean up the air on the streets of London. That disconnect is something that I don't think any of us as consumers, certainly not something that I would want when I buy an EV. 
Got it. Thank, thanks so much. That's a good point. Um, Emmanuel, we've actually got a question from the audience for you. Um, they say, what is the local perspective of cobalt mines in the DRC? You know, are enough people aware of the risks, the exploitation and dangers um, involved that we've talked about today? Lost. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, it looks like Emmanuel's um, cut out. Well, Anna, Annika, maybe you could answer that through your through your report. I mean, um, it is obviously um, startling what you've revealed, but is this is there an awareness locally that what's what's going on at these mines? Uh, there definitely is. I mean, people are well aware of the risks. Um, there, I would say Congolese are also aware of their rights and they've tried to unionize and tried to, um, you know, really push for both better pay, better conditions, better health and safety. But they are the kind of, you know, the ones with the least power in this equation. I mean, the workers we spoke to are clear that artisanal mining is particularly dangerous and a very precarious life. So if you can get a job at the mine, that's even better. Even then, you're in these precarious contracts. And if you manage to really, you know, be lucky, you'll get a direct contract with one of the mines and be paid a bit more. But people do it because they're desperate. And there is extraordinary unemployment in Congo and immense poverty. And so any job is better than no job. But I would say people are, are well aware of the risks and deeply concerned about what that means for them. Um, and, you know, they're desperate to pull themselves out of poverty, but to do that requires a living wage and very few of them are earning that. Fiona, I just want to ask, I mean, yes, we, we, you know, we've talked about the history of resources in the Congo, which isn't a happy one, obviously, but is there any chance um, of looking at this positively that it is great geological luck, right, to have all this cobalt, um, just as the EV, you know, the EV revolutions um, taking off? I mean, is this an opportunity? Can we have any hope that the Congo could, could benefit? It would be nice to, to think so. I think, you know, there are other minerals, lithium possibly as well. And, um, uh, you know, it would be nice to, to think, but I think there has to be a massive sort of shift in, um, in approach and rather than see the Congo as this resource to be taken advantage of, which I think, is, as Annika mentioned, about the repetition of history from the um, rubber as Annika, uh, resource and mentioned about the rapid history from the uh, resource and the last century, uh, 19th to 20th century. Um, and to, you know, we, 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 we know that as a, as, a, as a historical precedent, and it's been very, you know, uh, very articulately written about, and and it's a well-known um, narrative that we should be uh, embracing to uh, in order to prevent it happening again. So I think if there, you know, my job as a as a journalist really and a filmmaker is to give people a voice, and I think the more that we can give um, Congolese people a voice and 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 bring this to attention, then hopefully there will be um, uh, a more of uh, a sway to actually say, let's let's ensure that, let's put enough pressure, let's make sure that our governments um, uh, put pressure on the producers, um, on the car producers and car manufacturers, and as consumers that we um, all come together and say, well, we don't want a car that has been exploiting people in the Congo. We want um, them to be part of the, the green revolution and to to, to benefit as, as part of the green revolution. So I think, you know, it's up to consumers as well to say, you know, let's make this um, uh, positive for the Congo as opposed to continual exploitation. Yeah, uh, Emmanuel, I just wondered what you, what you think. Are you hopeful that Congo, I mean, it's in a good position to benefit from the green revolution. Uh, it has copper, it has cobalt, young population. I mean, I can't think of you know, better set of ingredients. I mean, are you hopeful that the country can, can benefit? Of course. I, I think you heard when, uh, uh, during the uh, uh, 26, and um, the Congolese government said, um, so I think we, we, we need to be part of it and to, to, to get a profit from, from, from that. 
that's why we are asking um, and we need everyone um, to, to, to come and help to improve the situation. So the solution is not to say, yeah, because there is a bad working condition, we, are, we stop um, trying to improve the situation. So the, the, the idea is to call uh, everyone who is involved in buying cobalt from Congo to come and to sit and to see what kind of solution we can bring together uh, to these communities uh, which are living around uh, mining or are working as, um, as an miners, how we can help them to formalize the, situ the situation on the ground. For instance, the big problem we have now is about, about uh, having uh, uh, at an mining zone because now people are working on private concessions. That's why we have these poor conditions, working conditions. We need to have, it asks some money and to see the money these big companies are spending uh, uh, financing um, a traceability mechanism, it's, this money can help people on the ground. So the, the idea, do we need just to uh, like uh, doing like having, um, uh, I don't know what kind of uh, system, which are just the way to, to, um, to lose this amount of money without uh, coming with a good solution to help people on the ground. For instance, if you, you need to formalize a, a, a natural mining uh, zone, you need just uh, five, five uh, million, just one million. And at the same time, you can see uh, people are spending uh, um, how much? Uh, um, um, uh, 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 Two um, hundred thousand. Uh, uh, Two hundred million um, in making it, uh, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. So the idea for us is we need uh, people to come with solution because um, the, it it, does, it doesn't ask a lot of money. It's just uh, about if we need to change, it's possible to change the situation on the ground. And uh, the, uh, the example of child labor from 2016. Now I can say. Um, as NGOs, which was uh, part of that uh, report, we 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 met um, uh, we we met we, we now the number of child labor is significantly reduced. So that's why we say it's also possible to change working conditions. Uh, and, and to and do that, maybe, maybe, to the maybe, mining, maybe, to the yeah. maybe yeah. I can add just something uh, to change working condition and else. Uh, also to have fair price for everyone because the, the other problem we have is a fair pr price so because as our miners they don't they don't they don't get enough what they are doing uh, as um, uh, what they are producing uh, copper or copper they don't get enough so we need a, pr a, a fair price for everyone so we can benefit from the green revolution Got it. And and what what about the um the government? Just I mean a final thought. I mean, what what, what needs to happen um at the government level? Um, that they are here, and we are talking to them. Um, um, and that when we publish after the publication of the report and the debate on, the, I think they are conscious. They are trying to take. Uh, to help, but at the same time, you have a lot of international initi initiatives coming in. So I think we need to, to 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 stay and see how much initiative do we need. And I think we don't need a lot of initiative. We will to change, and if we we take, uh, 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 it not cost a lot of money. And uh, yeah, so we, we, we can also push the government. And today I was thinking, why the Congolese government is not, is not is self investing to, 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 to investing or funding this, the system, the formalization of the system? Why not? Because why do you need just a uh, figura only to, to fund? Because you can 20% of, uh, you can give um, uh, to Trafigura just only 20% of. Uh, um, cobalt coming from as our miners for how much money for 80, um, 80 million dollars why, why Congress government doesn't like to, 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 to put uh, the hand in 
the pocket and then fund that. That that's the question, and um, we are pushing them to do something. But in terms of the regulation, good regulation, that's why we are asking. Um, instead of uh, having a lot of initiative, we can uh, implement what force what we have in place and see what does work, how we can fix it and improve in 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 instead of a lot of initiative coming in. And these initiatives um, are using money, which are, uh, uh, instead of helping people in need, just helping um, uh, the NGOs, uh, which have the system of traceability, for instance. And it's a question now, who will support the, the, the price of the traceability system, for instance. Yeah, who will support? And in more of the case, is uh, our migrants who will pay for that. Emmanuel, quick question from the audience. Do you think people should be encouraged to, to go into alternative um, jobs, alternative um, working conditions rather than COBOL? I think I think you know why people because if you try to of cobalt and copper, people we we we, we in Congo people um, mining uh, cobalt artisanally, there was not that before um, the crisis um, in nine, I think nineties yeah, and um, we there was just industrial mining. It's a uh, poverty because when the the people are poor, they can find another way to survive. That's why we have today mining. So if you have um, another means of, uh, to, I think it's possible to do, we can uh, do agriculture, we can do, um, even what I'm saying, we can sh also, ma man coming, the money coming from industrial, if we can share it, uh, a, 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 good with everyone that we have because now the money is not sharing well and the big parts of money uh, i can give you an example if a company uh, 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 tells you that they they have been invested two billion in congo uh, i think i don't know if they, how much services they, they are buying locally or in congo everything they are uh, imported them from out of side uh, outside of, of congo that means they are not supporting any more uh, Congolese economy. So they debate more than working condition. There's a debate we should debate to see how we can share the wealth. And Congolese uh, people should be part of the Green Revolution. And for them to be discussed and to see how we can share the wealth we have. Got it. Well, I'll bring to a close this discussion. Um, if you want to watch the full film by Vena, the cost of cobalt there should be a link on your um screen um and also the link to annika's um recent report on industrial mining um you should see that link as well um to find out more about afrowatch which is emmanuel's um uh, group you can see that link there and also uh, benchmark mineral intelligence you can see the website link um should be on on there as well um thanks so much everyone for, for joining us it's a fascinating um, it's going to be interesting to see um, what happens. And I'd just like to thank all my panelists. Thanks for the time on a Friday afternoon. And uh, look forward to uh, future events of The Conduit. Thanks so much. Thanks, Henry. Thank you. Thanks.